Welcome to Conversations with Big Rich. This is an interview style podcast. These interviewed are all involved in the off-road industry. Being involved like all of my guests are is a lifestyle, not just a job. I talk to past, present, and future legends, as well as business owners, employees, media, and land use warriors. Men and women who have found their way into this exciting and addictive lifestyle we call off-road. We discuss their personal history, struggles, successes, and reboots. We dive into what drives them to stay active in off-road. We all hope to shed some light on how to find a path into this world that we live and love and call off-road. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two. Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Tread victoriously. Have you seen Four Low Magazine yet? Four Low Magazine is a high-quality, well-written, four-wheel drive-focused magazine for the enthusiast market. If you still love the idea of a printed magazine, something to save and read at any time, Four Low is the magazine for you. Four Low cannot be found in stores, but you can have it delivered to your home or place of business. Visit fourlowmagazine.com to order your subscription today. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, I have the pleasure to speak with Emmy Hall. Hey, Big Rich, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Just to let everybody know, Emmy is an off-road racer, a rally competitor, an event MC, freelance <laughs> automotive media representative, and a past Rebel winner. I'm like, I do so many things. I'm not good at like any of them, but I do a lot of things. Hey, you know what? It's... <laughs> Like I've always said, you know, um, it's better to be a jack of all trades than a master of none. Absolutely. So, so how's your day going? Oh, uh, I had a great day. I was working on, so I have a, uh, I've got a 2015 Chevy Colorado and um, it's got total chaos, upper control arms and uniballs and all that stuff. Um, and this is a truck that I inherited from my dad. And he was not the best at prep your shit, if you know what I mean. Right. Um, so, like, the bushings have needed to be done for a long, long time. In fact, the car, the truck got his name, Squeaks, because the bushings were so squeaky. And I've called this truck Squeaks for years. And I did the bushings today and, like, it doesn't squeak anymore. I'm a little upset about that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you can just call it squeakless. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I hope. I hope. I honestly hope they start squeaking in like you know a couple hundred miles. I don't know. They probably won't because now like they're fresh bushings and it's all fresh grease and everything. So we'll see. Excellent. But then, um, and I was towing my off-road race car, buddy, the lifted Miata. And um, I'm working with a friend of mine who um, works for Hyperco and he's got like, he's just kind of the suspension dude. And like, I don't really know a lot about that. So I've had a, I've had a set of Fox shocks for this car for so long, but I didn't have the springs to go with it. And like, there needed to be some modifications to the control arm so that I could fit the springs and the shock and la 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 la. And like, I'm like 95% there now. And so I'm very, very excited about it. So Excellent. hopefully like by next week, Buddy will have Fox shocks and Hyperco springs on all four corners. Excellent. And we'll get in yeah. more into Buddy in a little bit, but let's, uh, let's find out more about Emmy and your early life. Where were you born and raised? Um, I was born outside of Los Angeles, California, in a town called Hacienda Heights. So just kind of the suburbs kind of almost North Orange County, um, San Gabriel Valley area. Um, so I grew up there most of my life. Um, went away for college and then I went away for grad school. Uh, I lived on the East Coast for a while and then I came back to California in 2015. Okay. And those early years, school years, what kind of activities were you into? Were you a good student or were you... I know a lot of oh, us yeah. that are in this industry were were okay students, but most of us just wanted to get out. Yeah, no, I actually I really like school and I, I really like learning. Like if I could go to school for the rest of my life, I'd be super excited. But <laughs> no, I was always pretty good in school, although I figured out like 
what's the minimum I need to do to get like a 3.75 GPA? You know, like I never needed to get straight A's, but I always wanted to get close to it, but I also was pretty lazy. <laughs> <laughs> did you, um, uh, did you do sports or anything? Um, people always like, like coaches and stuff always tried to get me into sports because I've always been pretty tall. Um, and especially when I was, when I was a kid and like junior high, I was always like a head taller than everybody else. So like they wanted me on the basketball team and the volleyball team, but like, I'm not very good at sports. <laughs> I enjoy sports. I enjoy playing sports, but if you want to win, you probably don't want me on your team. Um, and that was made very clear. Um, when I like, and basketball when like I can't jump I literally can jump like three inches off the ground like I'm pretty bad at it. I enjoy doing it I'm just not very good at it so okay. I mean mostly when I was a kid I did things like I did choir and I did drama like I really loved um I really loved being up on stage and singing and acting and I'm a terrible dancer um but I did a lot of musical theater which is people think is pretty funny um but yeah I've done like sound of music and um uh, Bye Bye Birdie and Oklahoma, like all of those classic American um, musicals, I've been in them. But you didn't, you didn't do the dan the the dancing portions. No, I was never. I was always in the. If I was a chorus member, I was in the singing chorus. And then if I was, if I got a part, I was always like, like the the quirky, you know, funny secondary character. I was never the ingenue. Never was I the ingenue. Oh my god, no! Right. I'm way too weird for that. <laughs> so after high school, you, you mentioned that you went back East and I'm assuming that was for college. Well, yeah, I went to, um, my undergrad, I did at UC San Diego. Okay. Um, and that was in the early nineties, which is like, Oh my God, that was so long ago. Um, so I did. Yeah. So I went down to UC San Diego and then I stayed down there for a while and just kind of like hop back and forth, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Diego, Los Angeles. Um, I moved up to Northern California for a while and I was doing theater up in this little town called Sonora. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, which is like so cute. And I, I just got, fell in with this great theater. I mean, it was really small. I didn't, I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> I got married at that point and like, we didn't have any money. He and I were just like, we're, we're broke, but we didn't care because we were having a good time. But this whole time that I was doing this, like I always really loved to drive. Um, and when I when I was younger, like I went out, my parents were divorced. And so I spent weekends with my dad and we would always go out to Giant Rock or out to Glamis or Pismo Beach or, um, you know, all over Southern California in the dune buggy. So I was always, at, I was always like a car person, but then I had this weird like theater life as well. And those two things, have played a very big part in my life. And it's just kind of weird to have dabbled in both, you know? Right. Well, I, I understand that you're quite the seamstress. Did that come early on? Did that, or did um, that come through the drama? Yeah. that I mean, once I, once I moved up to Sonora, um, I was able to start working in the costume shop which was really fun. And I, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I learned a lot there and, and, but I got to a point where I couldn't really learn anymore. And so that's when I decided I wanted to go to grad school. So, um, Yale school of drama had a one year program and I was like, Oh, that sounds kind of cool. Like I could, I could go for a year, you know, like, sure. I'll go to the East coast for a year. And then that turned into going to Yale for a year and then going to the North Carolina school of the arts to get a full MFA in costume technology, which is basically just like sewing. Um, and then after that, when I graduated, I worked for Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., Oh, um, which is the national park. It's now it's a national park, but that's where Lincoln was shot. Right. Yeah. So it was like super prestigious. And we had like fantastic actors. And I had so much money to spend. Like my budgets were so incredibly healthy. So it was really fun because I didn't have to like scrape by using, you know, crappy fabrics from from joann's or you know from walmart or wherever. like i got to go to new york and go shopping and like that kind of stuff was was really really fun um and uh that was when i got my uh first oh no 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 i was was i no I, that was i was on my second miata by that time but that while i was working at ford's theater that's when i first started reviewing cars 
um, because I had met somebody who, this was like 2009, maybe 10. Okay. So like YouTube was just kind of starting and I had met somebody who had a YouTube channel reviewing cars and I was like, well, <clears throat> I never reviewed a car before, but I really like to drive. And he was like, well, you know, shoot me a demo and see, you know, like, and let's, we'll see what you, what you've got. So like we shot it on like an actual video camera, you know, not an right. iPhone, but like an actual video camera. And uh, I reviewed my 2001 Miata and he was like, yeah, this is great. So the next thing I know, I'm getting like a car, a couple cars a month and I would drive them for the week. And then we'd go out into like the countryside in Virginia and we'd shoot these car review videos. And like, I didn't really know what I was doing at all. I was just like kind of watching other people and seeing what they did and the stuff that they mentioned and then kind of transferring that and bringing my own style into it. And, and it always came up to be like, is this car fun? You know, cause you can review a car from a lot of different ways. Is this car practical? Does this car have utility? Is this car reliable? And I'm like, that's not how I want to review a car. I want to review a car, is it fun to drive? Because life is too short to drive something that isn't fun. So that's kind of the, the bent that most of my reviews take is do what does it make me smile behind the wheel? Well, and that makes sense because anybody that knows you knows that, you know, your middle name is fun. <laughs> I mean, I try to be like, I try to have a lot of energy and like, you know, like be as happy as I can. And because, you know, we're put on this earth for a very short amount of time. So you might as well enjoy it, you know, and part of that is you know, drive what makes you happy, even if it's not, you know, like the best thing I saw, Rich, the best thing I've ever seen was a Mustang GT 500 with a car seat in the back. And I was like, nice. yes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause like, obviously this car is completely impractical for you, but you love it. And you're introducing your kid to a muscle car that is incredibly unsafe probably, but also really, really, really fun. And that, you know, <laughs> Like I said, if you love it, if you walk away from your car and you turn around and you smile, then you've bought the right vehicle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I smile every time I get out of my Raptor. Right? I know. Yep. I, your Raptor's pretty dope, though. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's nice. It is. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> I could... We'll get into the Rebel, but last year, you know, Shelly didn't go on, on the Rebel with us. Um because she was, she had to take care of my my mom while I went on the rebel, and uh -huh. I I only slept in the tent two nights. The rest <laughs> of the time I slept in the front seat, and it was comfortable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But Shelly goes, okay, this year we're we're gonna have to set up a tent uh -huh. because I'm not sleeping in the front of the truck. <laughs> and I said, but it's comfortable. And she goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> So I thought your energy came from Diet Dr. Peppers. It does. I, I realized as I was um, getting into the truck today that I have six empty cans of Diet Dr. Pepper on the floorboard of this truck. Not all and from today. One, I, you know what? And I'm going to bring it out. I'm going to bring one out right now because um, I took a cooler with me to my friend Michael's house so I could have some Diet Dr. Pepper and I have one left. So I'm going to bring it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, listen, I don't have a lot of vices. You know, I don't smoke. I don't really drink to excess. I don't do drugs. Like, this is my one thing. Perfect. Perfect. There you go. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I love the... Everybody used to think we're doing sound effects, but this is actually what what's happening. <laughs> <sighs> so good. So good. Ice cold, man. Excellent. So <laughs> around 2009 or so, you were... You were working in Ford's theater and started to do the videos. Yeah, I started, yeah, I started to do some car review videos. And um, when I could go on a on a press trip, which is when there's a so if there's a new model coming out <clears throat> or you know the next generation of something, uh, the manufacturer will decide who they want to invite, and they will invite you out to a specific location that really shows off the car because it's easier to bring journalists to cars than it is to bring cars to journalists, right? So they'll take you out someplace that, that really shows off the vehicle. So if it's a truck, you know, you'll go out <clears throat> to the desert somewhere, up to the mountains, whatever it is. Um, if it's a, if it's a uh, sports car, they'll go, you'll go get, 
take you to a place where there's some kind of windy road, whatever it is. And they'll put you up in a hotel and, and you get to drive the car on like these curated routes. And it's, it's not really work. I will tell you that it's not really work. <laughs> um, so when I, when my theater, when my schedule at the theater allowed for it, I would go on these trips. So then I started to meet people, you know, and like there was a door and so I opened it and like, oh, like, oh, these people really like me. I really like them. And so I was able to kind of um, start once the my original outlet, they, he kind of just stopped doing videos. I was able to kind of piggyback on to or, or get in with another group. So I worked with um, the Fast Lane Car for they're out of Colorado. So. I just like hired a freelance videographer in Washington, DC, and I would, they would just send the videos back. Um, and then I would work for them in the summer because we didn't, I didn't have any work at Ford's theater during the summer. So I would work for them during the summer in Colorado. And like, you know, it was just like meeting people and figuring out what, you know, who, who you like, who you want to work with, that kind of stuff. And I really wanted to work full time with them, but they were offering me a salary that I was like, no, like I'm grown, dude. I am grown. I need a real job. Make a better salary at McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. Well, and listen, a lot of a lot of auto journalists. First of all, a lot of them are men. Most of them are men, and most of them are married and have wives that have really good jobs. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm by myself. Like, I have to support myself, so I don't have the luxury of a second income. Um, <clears throat> but then at that point, uh, CNET got in touch with me because they were they were doing a bunch of hires for video and they'd see my videos and they're like, we'd like to hire you. I was like, that sounds great. And so that's what got me back to California Okay. because they're, they were headquartered out of San Francisco. So worked for them for like seven years. And then they like, we had a team of like 15 and they got rid of everybody except for one person. So I've been freelance for almost two years now. Okay. And yeah, when you, you said they were based in San Francisco, did you move to the Bay Area or were you able to? I did. You did. Okay. No, I, I did. I, I lived in a 330 square foot studio apartment in Oakland. And this like, I mean, it. listen, we were a bunch of hippies and I loved it. We had a yurt in the backyard. We had chickens. We had bees. We had a garden. We had a gray water system. Like I loved it. And my landlord was awesome and the rent was really reasonable and he was just great. And it was, it was just like this little commune of like five people. And I, I thought it was awesome. Um, but I mean, it was expensive. It was $1,300. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's cheap for San Francisco, but it was still really expensive. Um, <clears throat> and I really, I really loved the place, but I was traveling a lot. Right. Right. So the fact that it was small didn't really matter because I was on the road. But then once COVID hit and then I stopped traveling, I was like, wait a minute, this is really hard. Like all I do is get up out of my bed and I walk to my chair three steps and then I write all day in my chair and then I go to my bed like this is terrible. So <laughs> that's when I decided to um, move out, move down to the high desert. So now I've got a place in Yucca Valley and it's like, you know, it's a real house with a real, I've got a two car garage, which is nice. And um, I've got space to move around, and so it's 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 been a good move. It's been a good move. Excellent. So yeah. let's let's get into your early years of of off road. You said that uh, that you got to go to you went to Glamis and different places in the desert. Um, when did you start driving off road? As soon as I could reach the pedals. Okay. So I think that was about maybe eleven or twelve. My dad my dad had a sand rail. And, I mean, we were always like we had a three wheeler and that kind of stuff, and we would we would doink around on the three wheelers. But as far as four wheelers, when I was twelve, I could almost pretty much reach the pedals. Like I had to have a pillow behind me and all that stuff. But and um and I learned to drive out in Glamis in okay. that sand rail. Well, that's handy. And that was yeah, it was very handy. Well, I mean, listen, a sand rail can you know weighs you know five hundred pounds practically, so it'll do anything. But it was just a little sixteen hundred Volkswagen four speed transmission, like nothing special. Um, but yeah, that's where I, that's where I learned all of that. Um, and we did a lot of stuff out there in Glamis and giant rock, which is out near Johnson Valley. Right. Um, uh, do we went to Dumont a lot, you know, just all, all the regular haunts that, that families are still going to now. Um, and so I did that all through high school and then kind of got out of it 
when I got to college, just because I, you know, I was so busy and um, my, I was still, <clears throat> my dad had a house in Mexico, so I would still go down to Mexico whenever I could. Um, and we'd go out in the truck and that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes in the sand rail, but it was, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then I just kind of graduated. I think my first race was in 2011, maybe. Okay. So I was like, I was old. I mean, I was like in my late thirties. When That's you finally old got to start race. racing. Right. Because you got fear. You have fear. You know, when you start as a little kid in a trophy cart or whatever, like you have zero fear and you grow up having zero fear. Correct. You start it in your late 30s. You're like, well, I could die. <laughs> I could break my leg, you know. Exactly. Uh, but, we had a we had a drag boat when I was growing up. And when uh -huh. I got old enough to actually drive the boat and I wanted to start racing it and it wasn't for racing. I mean, but it was it was a fast, very fast boat. and. So I was like, hey, dad, you know, let's, let's, let's start racing this thing. And he was like, you know, um, that's a good idea. Let's, let's take the boat apart, get it all cleaned up. And then, you know, we can, we can look at that. Well, we took the boat, boat apart to reglass it and do all this work. It never uh -huh. got done and got back together. Oh, that's so sad. And, but later on he told me, he goes, I was afraid. And I go, what do you mean you were afraid? And he goes, you have no fear. I've watched yeah. you ski. I've watched you water ski. You know, I've watched you, you know, ride your bikes, um, all the things that you do, you know, you have no fear. You will die in that boat. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. goes, it was better just to tear it apart. And I was like, oh, so I knew I That's needed to work on it. Now I knew I needed to work on it, you know, but I would, I might've died. So it's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, at, at least when you were, when you're in, on four wheels, you have a cage, right? But right. Um, yeah. And the, you know, the first couple of races I did was the more powder puff. They do the, uh, fundraiser for Cedar Sinai breast cancer research center. Right. So I did that in, and at that point, my dad had a, a Baja bug that was basically the suspension was kind of set up like a play car, but it had a, it was ca fully caged and it had the belts and everything. It had all the safety gear and it had a 2180 dual car Volkswagen in it. So I had to run in class five unlimited. It was, but the suspension was not a class five unlimited car. You know what I mean? Like right. <laughs> kind of in between a five sixteen and a five unlimited, but um, you know, like it was just power puff. So who cares? And I just went out and learned and saw, you know, learned what the vehicle could do and you know, what to do when the back end starts fishtailing a little bit and how, you know, to, know that the rock is there, but don't look at it. Cause if you look at it, you'll drive straight into it and just, you know, like get your feet wet and kind of figure out what the heck I was doing. And then after a couple of those, I was like, well, I really want, I really want a race car. So we got a, a 1600 car, which is a great car because it's, it's limited. So you more money, more money certainly makes you faster, but it, it doesn't make you that much faster. You know what I mean? And it's really a driver's class because everyone's car is basically the same. Right. Some people, some people can get really into like light and light and parts and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, everyone's running, you know, less than hundred horsepower, less than 90 pound feet of torque. Um, and so that, that really teaches, that really taught me about momentum and never lifting and really pushing through your fear because those, I mean, that car is scary because you can't lift. If you lift, you're never going to get going again. Um, and, you know, I did okay. I would, I would podium every now and again. I, I was usually middle of the pack and like that was fine because all I wanted to do was to go and spend time with my friends and family and race a consistent race. You know, I wanted to be, I didn't necessarily want to start getting faster every single lap. I wanted to have consistent times and just be and finish, just finish, just finish, just finish. So, you know, so I didn't how, have. So how did you get, how did, how did you start racing? I mean, was it, did you see like the powder puff was available? So you wanted to try it or was it something through CNET? Yeah, actually my, my dad, dad racing? Me, yeah. My dad signed me up for that powder puff. He just called me and I was in DC and he called me and he's like, um, I signed you up for a race in October. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I never done it before. I was like, oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> and you know, that was like really low stakes because it was just a fundraiser, you know. So who cares? And so your dad, your dad was a racer. Yeah, my dad raced sixteen cars and ten cars. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so like I'd always, I'd been out to races before, you know, and I, I had, I don't remember helping to chase, but I, re I remember, you know, going out to different, the Moore race and the, um, some of the Hydra high desert racing association stuff. Um, I'm sure we went down for the thousand. I'm sure we did, but you know, so I'd, I'd been around it since I was junior high and high school. Um, but it never, I guess it never really occurred to me that I could do it too. And I, it, I didn't, it wasn't really big on my list until my dad signed me up for that. And I did it and I was like, oh shit, this is fun. Right. You know, like, this is, this is great. I really like this. Let's do this again. So then you went from racing in those California, Southern California desert races primarily. Uh -huh. And then you got into other types of racing. Was it, was any of this related to the, the media automotive freelance stuff or was, no, it, was it just no, a natural progression? It was, no, it was just, um, you know, cause at that point I, I, when I first started racing, I was still in that theater world and just doing the car stuff part time. So I didn't really have enough juice to be able to um, get those manufacturer vehicles for events like I can do now sometimes. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, and it was just something that was, that was fun. And I never really looked for sponsors or anything. And I, you know, I would race like maybe two, or two, maybe three times a year. And, you know, like I, I never really, I never wanted to race a whole season. I, cause it's just, it's so much work. It's so much work trying to having to tear the car down every single time, you know? Um, so I just kept it light and fun where I could work with my budget, both money and time, you know? Okay. And yeah. you ended up racing with the team Indiana Jeans. Oh, we were, we called ourselves the Indiana Jones. J-O-A-N-S. <laughs> oh, okay. Jones. Oh yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Jones. Yeah. Now that was, um, so at one, one year at Powder Puff, Emily Miller and whoever was her assistant at the time, they were going to all of the pits and talking to all the women and telling us about this event in Morocco called the Gazelle Rally. And I was like, oh, well, what's this? Well, I like to travel. What's this Gazelle Rally? So the Gazelle Rally is done in stock vehicles. It's not a race. It's a rally. It's a navigational rally where the point is not fastest time, but shortest distance between checkpoints. So it's all about driving in as straight a line as possible. And you might have a giant pile of rocks in between you and where you want to go. So you have to decide, are you going to go over it and risk your car? Are you going to go around it? If you get around it, how are you going to get back on your heading in the shortest, in the fewest amount of kilometers? Um, and so I was like, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. And I didn't have anybody to do it with, but the rally or Emily, I think had somebody, she was like, well, no, we've got this gal. Her name is Sabrina. You guys would be great together. And I was like, okay. So I met Sabrina. She seems great. She was a navigator. I was a driver. We showed up. I knew nothing. I could hardly change a tire. I didn't know anything about the vehicle. I didn't know anything about like recovery. I knew nothing. And uh, I think we finished like 75th or something. I can't remember. But, but you there had was fun. Where we put like an extra, I don't know, like 300 kilometers on our, on our, our clock because we were so lost. <laughs> Oh my God. It was so, it was so funny. It was so funny. So how um, did they, how did they score that? Is it just by what you're, they have a, like an odometer that they're on your vehicle or did they use satellite, you know, GPS? Yeah, no, like... that, no, you went off, you went off your, um, it's like a race calculator. You went off your odometer. So, they, so everyone's odometer was calibrated. Okay. So you knew, so you knew what your exact odometer reading was you knew that it was accurate um based off of you know whatever tires you had right and then we all like we had a terra trip so that's how we did all of our distances but when they did the when they did the calculations they went off of the vehicle's odometer i don't think they do that anymore um but it's calculated by you want to have this 
the smallest, the fewest points. Right. So, like, if you miss a checkpoint, I think it, it sometimes they'll they'll penalize you sixty kilometers. Sometimes they'll penalize you thirty. I can't remember what it is, but the goal is to get the fewest amount of points. And I mean, one year I lost fourth place by a half a kilometer. Wow. And and total chaos. Nicole uh, Patel and Chrissy Beavis they lost first place by like a maybe a kilometer and a half. I mean. When you get up there, once you start getting good, it gets, it's just like the rebel. It gets really, really, really close. And I mean, we would do things like we would drive up to a flag, but I wouldn't drive all the way up to it because I'm like, if I can save like a hundred meters here, then I can save a hundred meters. And over time, like that might add up to a full kilometer. You know what I mean? So like we would do all these things. If there was a, if we were following a road, we would always cut the corners, you know, like always do all of these little, little tiny things because it, the competition was so, so very close. So everybody was probably trying to do the same thing. So all those corners became. Yeah. Well, I mean, the people that were, that were trying to win, listen, you can go, you can watch the, the trackers of everybody and you, all of the trackers should be a straight line. Right. And there's only like 10 checkpoints in a day or something like there's not that many, um, but it does go over nine days, but there's only, there's very few checkpoints. So you, you should see these straight lines, right? Straight lines. And there are people where it looks like spaghetti. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, you're not even, you, 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 you don't, you have no idea where you are. You have no idea where you're supposed to go. And it's just like, <laughs> just stop. Girl, just stop. Um, yeah. If you don't know where yeah. you're going, especially on a, on a distance, you know, where, where it's by distance, you don't drive yeah. around looking for it. You stop and yeah. figure it out. Yeah. Okay. But you know, the, the gazelle is the same thing in that um, it's all women. Number one, um, there's no GPS. So you're doing everything with just your compass and your map. The maps are terrible. The maps are like photocopied 50th generation photocopies of maps from like 1940s. And there's roads that are there that aren't there anymore. And all, I mean, they're, they're so bad. They're so, so bad. Um, it's amazing anyone finds anything on that. So, so when when you're in the rebel and Emily hands out the the blank map. Oh my god, it's amazing. Those maps are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I think the teams maybe maybe should practice for more of the uh, blank maps. Yeah. The whiteouts. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They weren't quite as bad as the whiteout maps, but they were close. They were okay. pretty close. So, but the, you know, the thing about the gazelle rally is that you, because you want to get as few kilometers as possible, there are some times when you're going over some stuff that you probably shouldn't be going over because it's the shortest distance. Right. So there's much more wear and tear on your vehicle. Um, and my first year, like I said, because I didn't know anything, um, I drove too fast and I just smacked the truck. I don't, I, it was something in a, like came across a washout or something and I bent the frame of the truck and they were going to, they were going to DQ us and they were going to not let us go anymore because they're like, it's unsafe. I was like, that's a bullshit. We do this all racing all the time. We keep going. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> but I'm like, oh my God, like I just, this is my first time here and I've like spent this money and now I'm not going to go. And I was just like, you know, just like in tears and everything. And then they basically said, well, you can't go any faster than, I think it was 50 kilometers an hour, which is only 35. And I was like, all right, fine, fine, fine. I'll do it. So they tracked my speed for the rest of the rally. Which might have helped. Yes, of course it helped. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drive so fast, numb nuts. It's not a race. <laughs> Too funny. Oh, man. So, But, yeah. Yeah, so from gazelles, then uh, what other type of racing not getting into rebel yet but you 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 know you're doing the southern california thing you know with some of the organizations down there did you ever race nora um i did uh so my my dad and i tried to race nora one year in the in the baja bug um and we started in mexicali and we got to just north of san felipe and the whole motor decided to go, not today. 
just gas pouring everywhere carburetor just pouring out pouring out oh no okay oh yeah it was bad it was bad so but we were able to get the get it home so he has a place in san Felipe. we were able to get it home and then we basically put everything in the tacoma and chased the race down to um la paz or cabo wherever it ended so that was fun so we weren't racing but we were still there and then a couple of years ago um i did it with volkswagen they were campaigning the id4 electric vehicle right so it was me an engineer and tanner faust really <laughs> and i was like what is happening here <laughs> so I got to drive with Tanner Fowles riding right seat for me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is, I'm so nerve-wracking. And he's so nice. He's such a nice guy. And I learned a lot from him because he was – he's like, listen, I can tell you right now, it's going to be really hard for me to sit in this seat. And I'm going to tell you what to do. And I'm like, Tanner, it's fine. You tell me tell me what to do. I am happy to learn from you because you know more than I do. You drive way more than I do. So I'm happy to learn from you. So it was, it was really fun. Um, but we did once we added up all the time on that we ended up i think we finished like 25 hours after the first place finisher because wow. we were in a rear wheel drive electric car and having to stop to get it charged well we were able to charge on the transit stages okay so we didn't lose too much time well, i think once we, once we had a hard time but most of the time our charging was done during the transit stage. It's just that when you're on the special stage, you're just so slow. <laughs> so, so you're charging on transit station sections. Is that like with a really long extension cord or what? Yes, we had a really long extension cord that went from Horsepower Ranch and then it went all the way down the peninsula. <laughs> uh, no, they. It was actually pretty ingenious. So they had a um, they had a a box trailer. And with a generator, essentially. So we would, there isn't, there's nothing that says that you can't put your car on a trailer for the transit stages. So they'd put the car on the, in the trailer, they'd plug it in, fire up the generator, and then they'd drive to the next, start of the next special. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, at this point, all you can do. I mean, even if you had renewable innovations there with the green hydrogen charging, like that's a mobile charger, but it's not like mobile moving as you're charging type of thing, you know? So, right. um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know someone else might be able to come up with a better solution, but for right now, that's really the only way that you could do it. So, um, yeah, yeah, but it was fun. It was fun. It was a completely inappropriate vehicle, but it was fun. So let's, let's talk about buddy. Okay. He's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. gather that. Um, except for maybe your cats, but we'll get to cats here in a little bit. So, Buddy is uh, is your Miata. It's your second Miata. Oh no! Well, yes, uh, I have two Miatas. Okay. Uh, but I think Buddy Buddy is like the fourth one I've owned. All right. Fourth or fifth. Um, so Buddy is an, a 2001 uh, Mazda Miata. Um, 1.8 liter. Uh, I have supercharged it. So right now I'm turning 135 at the wheels, uh, which is about a 30% increase from where it was stock. And there's more, there's more boost in that supercharger, but I'm just, I'm just going for reliability. Um, I'm not necessarily going for speed. And um, <clears throat> I run 28 inch BFG KO2s. They're pretty heavy, so it's re-geared, so it has 538 gears in the back. Nice. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's so dumb. Um, uh, and then I've got a, um, a stage one clutch for the supercharger for the extra power, but the transmission is stock, stock five-speed manual. Okay. Um, and then we're in the process right now of getting the Fox shocks and Hyperco springs dialed in. Um, and it's got a, a lift on it. So I think I've got like 10 inches of ground clearance, maybe. Like it's a, it's a fair amount. It's a fair amount of ground clearance. So with those, um, with those, with that gearing ratio that you have, what uh -huh. do you, what's your top speed? 
Well, on the pavement, uh, my speedometer isn't exactly correct, but I mean, I've seen 80. Okay. Fair enough. There's, there's more in there. There's, there's a little bit more in there. Um, but I want, and I wanted to supercharge it because I wanted the power lower since I've got those low gears and I, I just, I didn't want to, there's no reason for me to wait for any turbo to kick in. Right. Because the car's never going to be going that fast in the dirt. I've only got eight inches of wheel travel. Right. You know, so like there's no, so that's why I supercharged it as opposed to turbocharging it. Um, and it, that has all been, that has all been great. So it's got a fuel cell. So all of that is now very fancy and, and legal for racing. Um, full cage. Window Ricardo nets. seats. What's that? Window nets, harnesses. Window. I got window nets, Ricardo seats. I got belts. I got rugged radio and an intercom. Uh, what else? Uh, rigid lighting. So I got a yellow. I got an amber and a blue in the back. Because I got to run a blue light because it's a slow car. Right. And then the amber light. Everyone needs to run an amber in the back. And then I've got four rigid LED pods up front. Um which is awesome. Although only two are wired in, but don't tell Rigid that. Um, <laughs> I got to wire the other two in. You shouldn't have put that. I'll, I'll, I'll have to cut that part out. No, no, okay. no it's fine. All right. I, listen, listen, I'm not, I don't, if anyone looks at the wiring on this vehicle, they're just like, what are you doing? It is a giant mess because I, I'm just learning. And so when you're learning, things aren't necessarily pretty. Oh, I understand. Anyway. As uh, yeah, I'd get stuff from people and they'd go, okay, we want you to put this on the car. And on my Jeep and, you know, uh-huh. the old black Jeep, you've seen it. And yeah. it was like, okay, so I'd have, you know, I'd be, I don't have a house or a garage. We were living out of the semi truck. Right, right. So what more, you know, I didn't have all the fancy tools and stuff like that. It was just like, okay, run some wire, put some butt connectors on there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll just zip so tie, the, maybe zip tie those wires to other wires. Yeah, that's exactly. You know, I got five hundred pound, five hundred extra pounds of wiring in my Cherokee. I know, I know. I, like at some point, I would love someone to redo it, but like working in that vehicle, it's it's so small. And now that you've got the now that you have the cage and the seats in there, it, there's just not a lot of room to maneuver, you know. And yeah, it's 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 hard. But and I have like I still have the stock dash, so I just have like. The switch is everywhere. Like the ignition switch is like on one side and the, the switch for the fuel pump. Is like, it's just, nothing's labeled. It's all just like these random switches everywhere. So like, nobody's oh stealing it, right? Well, the ignition is labeled oh, okay. uh, with duct tape, but it's labeled yellow duct tape, but that is labeled, but nothing else is labeled. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so bad. It's so bad. And I have friends who are like, their, their vehicles are dialed in and they look at it and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, just shut up. Does it work? Yes. Just leave me alone. Yeah. And it, it actually got you through the, what was it? The gambler class? Yeah. So, so this year, this past year, last March at the mid 400, uh, Matt Martelli gave us a gambler class. So gambler 500 is started out as a group of people up in Oregon outside of Bend and they basically go out and pick up trash but they've gamified it so that you they say pavement is lava so in order to get to the area where everyone's going to go pick up trash you need to get there using as little pavement as possible and of course you're picking up trash along the way but they do these huge cleanups and I went to the regu- I went to the one in July this year, and I mean, there were like twenty dumpsters full. People were bringing back boats and and junked cars, and just like all this crazy crap was coming out of the forest up there. It was amazing, and they just do a. It's just a great group of people who will basically do anything to their cars. It's not the safest. I don't want to say that the it's definitely a safety third quality to some of the builds, <laughs> but it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So um, they gave us a gambler class, and of course you needed to have all the safety stuff, right? But other than that, they were like, we don't care. So I was racing against a um, a diesel old diesel Mercedes and a Subaru Justy 
a lifted limo, but the limo, the lifted limo was actually there in 2022 as well. Um, and then the vehicle that should have won, which was a Nissan hard body. And I'm like, that should win. It's an actual truck. But I knew because everybody that were driving were all dudes. And I'm like, and no one really had ever driven in a, in an actual race before, except for the guy in the Subaru. He comes from class 11. I was like, okay, I got to watch out for Scott because he knows what he's doing. But these other guys are just going to overdrive. And oh my God, they all overdrove. <laughs> and all I had to do was survive and I won. Nice. So yeah, so they gave us a hundred, they gave us a hundred miles. They gave us one lap. And uh, word on the street is this year, they're going to give us two laps. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that, man. It was real hard. It took me four hours to do a hundred miles. And like, I didn't have, I, I just, we were on the first day and it, the course was so redded out that like, I, I didn't have enough clearance. I was just constantly scraping the bottom of the car and scraping the bottom of the car. And I don't know, it's, it might be a little too rough for that car, but we'll, we'll see. Well, in the, we'll see the mid 400 it. course has just been, I, I don't want to say was, beat to death, but it's been beat to death. Yeah. There were some parts where I was like, what am I doing now? This is stupid. Right. This is stupid, but I honestly, I didn't have, I got high centered on a rock once. And then one of the military vehicles that were entered came through and just like yanked me off, just winched me off. So that was cool. And then my throttle got stuck once and it cleared itself, but that was, that was it. Aside from, you know, at the end when I was like, Oh, that shock mounts cracked, that shock mounts cracked, that, you know, exhaust thing is done, you know, those things. But I really like, 20 miles an hour, I think I averaged, and I just, I had a couple people pitting for me. They just came in, shook the wheels, didn't need to fill up on gas. I mean, it was amazing. I can't believe I can't believe it actually made it. And then when it won, and then when I finished, they weren't ready for me. They were doing qualifying for the big courses, the big cars. And the guy's like, what? I'm like, I'm done. I, I need to get off. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it was pretty funny. But So qualifying, cool. the, they were qualifying on part of the race course that you needed to finish on? They were, um, no. Okay, good. No, but they were still running the qualifying cars. And so, like, there was no one there waving a checkered flag for me. Like, <laughs> I didn't get the big, like, fire spurts or anything. I'm like, what are you talking I'm done. I just did this in a Miata. You guys just, like, killed myself. Can I have some fire? They didn't have you come back through for, like, a, a you know, the photo shot? No, but I wrote I wrote a story about it for Haggerty. Right. And, um. I think he photoshopped in some flames. Oh, there you go. I think he did. Excellent. Yeah, it was great. I mean, listen, the, and the whole reason I did that is because there's this, there's another lifted Miata guy. Um, his name's Dylan. I don't know how you say his last name, but it's like P F O Y L or something. He's got one. And on Instagram, he was bragging that he was going to be the first Miata to race them in 400. And I was like, no, son, you're not. You're not. That was the whole reason I went was just so I could race him. And then he didn't even show up. He's like, no, I'm not going to make it. I'm like, the whole reason I'm spending all this money is because you said you were going to make it. Sounds like an influencer. Oh, I was so mad. <laughs> but you beat him to like, it. I did not have the money to do this. You know, like, <laughs> getting that cage installed was, you know, it's just so much money. Oh God. But you know what? Now I have a race car and I love him. So excellent. Yeah. So let's, In the end, it's let's talk about your love of cats. I, I, <laughs> I follow you. I follow your social media <laughs> Yeah. as I do a lot of the rebels and uh, I'm so sorry. I see you with cats everywhere you go. Well, not always your cats. No, I really like to annoy them. Is that because, it? Yeah. 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 Because you know, cats, are sometimes not accepting of your love. But Rich, I have so much love to give. And if a cat will not accept it, I will force that cat to accept my love. Um, and it makes for really good pictures right. because they're always so mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, yeah. cats, cats believe that they're, that they're gods because you don't own a cat. A cat decides to live with you. Exactly, exactly. And, and tolerate you so that yeah. you can take care of it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, is the trade-off okay? Because maybe if they don't like you that much, they'll leave. They'll leave. 
Yeah. It'll happen. It'll yeah, happen. I can't tell you how many times, you know, cats that, that, that I've had have shown up because the neighbor got them, but they liked my house better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is, the My cats that I have now are indoor cats because, you know, I live out in the desert and there's snakes and there's spiders and stuff that can. Coyotes. That can, yeah, you know, like they, so I'm like, mm, you guys are indoors, sorry. Um, but I do, I take them down to Baja with me. And um, I just throw them in the truck, and I'm like, get used to it. And uh, do you have a problem okay. taking them over the border and then bringing them back? No, no. Most of the time, they're like underneath my seat, oh. so they don't even know that they're that they're in the in the vehicle. But I've I have never had a problem. Now, I do know if you take a dog across the border, you have to have your dog either crated or tethered somehow. Um, so people who are taking their dogs, you need to make sure you do that because you might get pulled over and that is an actual real ticket. They're not trying to shake you down. Right. Um, but cats are fine. I don't know. Yeah. Cause they have all those military checkpoints down in Baja and you know, if you yeah. got a, a loose dog, they, they want you to get out and they're going to, you know, they're going to look through your glove box and under your seat. Of course, when they reach under your seat and there's cats there, there's cats and they're like, what the heck is this? Yeah, really. Oh, that's just- they're That's probably thinking, crazy cross. Americano cat woman. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're super cute. I love them. But I really want a dog, but I travel too much to have a dog, so I can't have a dog. Right, I understand that. Yeah, so one day. Let's let's talk about let's talk about the rebel, and uh, okay. and how that all played out for you, and and your success, and what you've done around it. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um, you know, when Emily was starting it, I was like, well, I have, to, you know, like, I have to go do this, obviously. Um, and I didn't have a vehicle, and nor could I get a vehicle at that point. Um, so I just told my dad, I'm like, I'm taking your truck for a month. So sorry, not sorry. Um, so we did it in the truck I'm sitting in now, the 2015 Colorado. Um, with the total chaos, uh, upper control arms and King shocks and stuff. And, um, we did really well until the very last day. And then we made a really dumb mistake that dropped us from a potential first to 11th place. So that was fun. Wow. Yeah. That That sounds like the rebel. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then the next year, um, I was actually able to convince Chevy to give me a ZR2. So I think Chevy was the first the first manufacturer vehicle to go in there. Although it wasn't necessarily like a manufacturer team, they gave it to me to drive for a story. You know what I mean? It's right. not like like we have it now with the like they didn't send out a press release. They didn't like support me in any way. They just gave me the vehicle. Um, but that was I, and it took a lot. It took some convincing, you know, because they didn't really know. But um, I think they wanted to see that ZR2, you know, get out there and, and they knew that I had shown them pictures from the first year. And so they knew that they would get some, at least some good photos. Right. So, and then for that one, we got, uh, I think we got third. I think we got third. Um, And then the next year Jeep, that was the first year of the two liter turbocharged Wrangler. So Jeep was like, yes, take this vehicle. I was like, okay, cool. But again, not a factory thing, just a journalist thing. Um, And then that year we tied for first. (laughs) It's still amazing that we tied for first, but we tied for first. Um, And then after that, it was like, after we had that one under our belts, it was like, we could kind of get any car we wanted to, you know? That helps, Um, yeah. Yeah, but then we decided, like, well, let's go to Crossover. Let's do something really dumb. What can we do that's really dumb? Oh, Rolls Royce has got that new SUV. Let's ask them. And they, I just asked them, and they were like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. We'll give you a $400,000 calling in to take on an offer rally. Like, but I will tell you what, that was the classiest car that I've ever seen out there. I mean, over all the the Raptors and the G wagons and the Land Rovers and everything else that we ever have, have had out there. That, oh my God. that Cullen, I mean, you guys needed to have like, like a Butler ride with you. I know. I know. Well, we practically did because we, you know, like, listen, we threw a lot of codes in that car. We threw a lot of codes. 
and uh, it would say like, "Please pull over and call your Rolls Royce representative." <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, and they, the the and the problem with that vehicle is like your your wheel and tire package can only be so big <coughs> because of how the spindle is. Right. And then your wheels have to be pretty big because the brakes are giant, right? So you have to have at least like, I don't know, 20 inch wheels, 19s maybe. Um, and your total package can only be 31. Right. And so I came really close. I was like, Nitto was getting back there. Like Nitto was like, I think we've got something that you guys can can run, uh, but let me check back with you. And as that was happening, Rolls Race was like, well, we just want you to run on the snow tires. I was like, what? And how many are you going to provide? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Um, it was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, yeah, note to self, don't run snow tires in the dirt. Um, I mean, we had two. Um, what I didn't know is that I could have given more, I could have taken another spare and given it to the mechanics to carry. I wasn't clear on that rule at that time. Um, but we carried two with us, and we did get two flats at one time um, in Barstow, which makes sense. Um, and then that, and we'd already gotten a flat earlier. So we were running on a plugged tire already. It was just, it was a nightmare. Um, so, so how many, up, how many, how many flats have you had on the Rebel? Do you think? I had one in the Jeep. I had three on the Cullinan. I think just four. That's not bad. Okay. And then, but. The media vehicle that I had this year, I got three. <laughs> right. <laughs> did did you, Listen, and those were those were you weren't even in in an area that was a regular route, were you? No, I was not. Okay. I was not. Um, but I learned some things about I learned some things about OEM quote off road tires from that and from Nick and from getting those flats that I didn't know before. And what's that? Um, well, you know, like a lot of OEMs, they're like, yeah, well, these are, we, it comes with KO2s. It comes with um, Falcon Wild Peaks. It comes with whatever. But the tire manufacturer will do a run of tires that are very specific for that vehicle and what the car manufacturer wants. So just because it says it's a, it's a Falcon Wild Peak, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Falcon Wild Peak. Because when I got, when I ran over, okay, a railroad spike, which would have done in any tire, right? It right. doesn't matter. But, and when I took that to the, when I was at the mechanics and I was talking with Nick, the lead mechanic for the Rebel, and he was like, what, what tire is this? I'm like, it's, it's a, it's a Falcon. Well, he's like, well, what's the load rating? I'm like, well, I don't know. So we're looking for the load rating. There's no load rating on it. He's like, I think this is actually a passenger sidewall. He's like, this sidewall is super, super crazy flimsy. And there's no, there was no load rating marked on it at all. So it's like, you know, the manufacturers want to have an off-road tire for some of their off-road vehicles, but they also want, they don't want to compromise on right. ride quality on the pavement. So they have these special tires. I, I had no idea. I had no idea that was a thing, but I think that's a thing. Um, so after I learned that, I was like, well, no wonder, <laughs> you know, right. and I didn't have, and I had a, a, my spare was a street tire. So there was that, that was a thing too. So, <laughs> yeah. So back to yeah. the, back to the rebel, what is it, what is it that you most like about the rebel? Um, I mean, I like that it's hard because it's hard, you know, it gets harder every year. Um, what, what, would, what do you mean out. by, what do you mean by hard for those that, that aren't, that aren't around? Um, it's hard. It's hard physically and mentally, you know, for me, and this isn't the same for every team, but for me, the driving doesn't really get difficult um, until you get to Glamis. You know, right. Um, especially up in the north, like in the northern part of the course, it's a lot of, you know, gravel roads and, and really fun things, but nothing that's like 
every once in a while we'll get like a, a butt pucker road. But if you've if you've got experience behind the wheel, there isn't necessarily anything that's gonna make you like, oh shoot, I don't know if I should try that. Then you get to Klamis and then you're like, well, I don't know what's gonna happen out here. Um, but that's my experience. Other people might find Glamis easier and some of the other dirt stuff harder. You know, it just all depends on on what your style is and, and what your experience is. But so, and I love that, I love giving away my phone. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so great. It's so great to give away your phone. Um, I hate the mornings. I hate them. I hate them. I, I'm terrible in the mornings. I hate getting up. Um, I like figuring out the like little tricks, you know, like, you know, Rebecca and I would have like our own little tricks that we would do to like save time or make our lives a little bit more comfortable, you know, like, like don't get dressed in the morning. If you're going to change your clothes, change your clothes as soon as you set up your tent and then sleep in those clothes. And then you don't have to change your clothes when it's cold, like little things like that, figuring out those little things that just give you like a little bit of an edge that, that kind of stuff was always really fun. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I'm just going like, where are we? I don't know. Where do you think we are? I don't know. Let me see the map. I don't know. <laughs> and what was the, uh, what do you, I know that you're, you're no longer a competitive team in the rebel. You've joined the staff. Yeah. And tell me about being on the staff. Well, I will tell you this being on the live show staff is a lot. It's probably the easiest job on staff because everybody else is working their butts off. 24 seven. And for us, I mean, like, you know, we are, we're, do, we're doing things during the day, but it's not like, like the ops crew who's like, you know, making sure that the tents are running well or the kitchen crew who's like constantly just cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking. Like my job as, as someone who just talks, it's, it's not very hard. It's pretty easy. And it's really fun, you know, cause we get to go out and like, figure out little packages that we can play of like stuff that happens during the day. And um, it's really like our team is just so creative and the, the guys that are filming and editing, they're so fast. They're like, they can just turn They'll be editing in the back of the car as we're like, maybe we've driven out on course or something. We've done an on course update. Then we're driving back to base camp and they're editing in the back <laughs> of the car and the, on their computers. I'm just like, Oh, you guys are so amazing. Um, and I just, I love working with those guys. It's just, it's great. It's great. And I love being able to do, um, interviews with people. Um, I just, it, it's so great to see them coming because I know exactly how they're feeling. You know, I can see it. I know exactly like, oh, it was a great day or it was a shitty day or, you know, oh, they're having a hard time in the truck. Like I get it. I get it. So just being able to like be there for them and, and be, someone who's experienced, but who's not competing in that moment. You know, I think that that can be valuable for some of them, for some of the people. Right. I know the, um, Shelly's built quite a relationship with a lot of the teams. Um, yeah. Being the only female course worker. Yeah. Um, when they get to the green checkpoints and, you know, they've maybe had a real difficult section up to that point. Yeah. They can, yeah. They can say, you know, they've got a, a shoulder to, Right. lean on maybe yeah i mean yeah. it's a it's a rock a shoulder of a rock but you know <laughs> and, and for those that don't know we the course workers call ourselves rocks because we don't know anything we don't we don't give away anything um we just we are there to observe and to to uh facilitate the 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 moval of vehicles down the course when needed yep that's it that's it yep so what is what's the plans for Emmy going into the future? Well, um, now that it looks like these uh, shots are going to be done, uh, I'm going to sign up for Rage at the River, Rage at the River, which is in Laughlin, uh, and that's in the beginning of December, like the second weekend in December. And what I like about this race is it's over two days. You race an hour and a half on Saturday, an hour and a half on Sunday, and it's kind of short coursey. Like, 
I think each lap is maybe 14 miles. And like you kind of go out into the desert, but like not really. And there's a whole stadium section that is just a little bit smoother. It's not like crazy whooped out. There's not like a ton of rocks, you know, it's just, it's easier on a lifted Miata than like Barstow, you know? Right. Um, so, uh, so hopefully I will make that. Um, and then, um, let me see what else is going on. Um, I have a trip to, uh, to India planned for next July. It's a little bit, it's a little bit far out, but, um, we're going to drive Tuk Tuks, which is those little three wheeled, like right. kind of motorcycle things Yep. through the Himalayas. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm very excited about it. That sounds cool. It's going to be dumb. <laughs> do you guys, do you guys get to d- decorate your own? Cause those things are always just. Yeah. Pretty wild. Yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever we can bring or find there, we can, we can decorate it. Um, okay. So, so I'm really stoked that that is going to be really fun. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like 10 horsepower at elevation. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get some, I'm going to get some canisters, you know, some oxygen canisters. Um, and frankly, I don't know how I'll do with the altitude. I don't know. I, you know, like I've spent plenty of time in the mountains, but like, you know, 10,000, 12,000 feet, not like 18,000 feet of the fucking Himalayas. Right. But we'll see. We'll see. It'll be, make a great story. I know. It's going to make an awesome story. So I've got that planned. Um, January, there's a, a lot of work things. Um, the consumer electronics show is happening in Vegas. There's a lot of um, electric stuff. That's The CES is now, it used to be just all about TVs and computers. Now it's like, it's all the cars. It's like, it's the new car show. Um, and that's where a lot of manufacturers will debut um, their EV stuff or whatever tech improvements that they have so okay. i'm gonna go to that with honda and um yeah just try to go down to baja and hang out in baja um and then we'll see whatever whatever wherever the wind takes me i guess baja with your cats <laughs> baja with the cats i can't leave them at the house come on they'd be so sad no that's true that's true i gotta take them with me <laughs> they're so funny they're so cute do they, do they try, I guess they travel well. Like we had our cat Callie that used to ride in the semi truck with us and uh-huh. we'd open up the semi truck. We never had to have a leash on her, anything like that. Well, she wouldn't, she, I tried to put a harness and a leash on her when we took her from a house cat to move her into the, the, uh, our motorhome slash semi truck. And uh-huh. she laid there the first night that I put the harness on her. Like I put a 50 pound sack right. of sand on her. <laughs> I mean, she didn't move, you know, from, right, from right, when right. I put it on her to the next morning. Or if she did, she went right back to where she was at. And then, you know, after a couple of days, she kind of got used to the harness, but really did not like it at all. Yeah. And as soon as I put the leash on it to try to take her out to the to the RV, uh-huh. she did this like jump, spin, twist, Houdini move. That and all of a sudden I'm holding the leash and the harness and the cat is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> I don't know how she got out of that thing, but she did, and she was like, "Never again are you putting that on me." Oh my god, that's so funny. Yeah, no, I just honestly, I just I scoop them up before they can think about it, and I throw them into the truck, and then and they protest for like 15 minutes. And then they, then they settle down and they just go underneath my seat and they're just like, all right, we'll just hang out until we get there. So, so far I've had, I haven't had anyone poop or throw up. So I think we're doing pretty good. Wow. That's pretty good. At least not the cats. I mean, I've pooped and thrown up in the truck. Right. But <laughs> oh, now see that what I might expect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emmy, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and spending some time and talking with me and uh, no, letting so people stoked. know more about Emmy Hall. Yeah. And I can't wait to see you again. It's always a joy. Um, I know. It's, yeah. Sorry. I was, I was almost said me too. And I'm like, mm, that sounds weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, if people want to follow me on Instagram, I'm uh, yeah, Emmy. And that's, that's where I post the most. Um, 
I'm not really, I keep my Facebook for like people I actually know. Um, but yeah, Instagram is good. Yeah, Emmy. Yes. And uh, anybody out there listening to this, it's absolutely, she's, Emmy's awesome. Um, follow her. It's, uh, it's worth, it's worth the time for sure. Yeah. You'll see, you'll see a bunch of press cards and then a bunch of Lyft and Yada stuff. And um, often me going like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm going to try it anyway. There you go. Yeah. That's how I roll. Well, listen, that's what YouTube is for, right? Yep. If that I, is. If I can't figure it out. YouTube can tell me how to do it. Correct. Correct. <laughs> I, it amazes me what you can find on YouTube. I know it's incredible. It really is incredible. And I'm like, how is this thing on here? Like, yeah. Anyway. Yep. All right. Much. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, we will talk later and I will Thanks, see Big you Rich. on the rebel. If not sooner. Yeah. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Well, that's another episode of conversations with big rich. I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you could do us a favor and uh, leave us a review on any podcast service that you happen to be listening on, or send us an email or a text message or a Facebook message, and let me know uh, any ideas that you have, or if there's anybody that you have that you think would be a great guest, please forward the contact information to me so that we can uh, try to get them on. And always remember, live life to the fullest. Enjoying life is a must. Follow your dreams and live life with all the gusto you can. Thank you.